All right. So uh, the following notes uh, are more like uh, help, and uh, I'm going to speak uh, a little bit of this and a little bit of that around the topic of temporality. So there is uh, this is not a proper argument. It's uh, some points of view. Uh, so. Uh, and I'm going to read, sorry for, I'm used to speaking more freely, but now because of this is translated, I will try to be very strict to the paper. I, I hope you understand. So this, this talk looks at the temporality of artistic research processes from several perspectives. First, I take as starting point the differences between art forms, depending on the size of typical works and the average process of production, and the differences between different types of artistic research, depending on the interdisciplinary entanglements. I will also present a simplified model, distinguishing between approaches where the main focus is an ongoing practice, uh, or on the one hand, and a singular work or product on the other, uh, between uh, processes that focus on experimentation and developing something new, and processes that focus on reflecting on something done previously. That's one part. So second, I will reflect on the design and structure of a research process using as, as examples how doctoral processes are structured in Sweden and in Finland. Uh, in, uh, in Sweden, with a four-year model, which is divided in 30%, 50%, and 80% seminars with discussions, or a, a more open model with artistic works and so-called linking papers examined or pre-examined along the way in Finland, uh, which is probably more similar to what you have in France. Thirdly, uh, I discuss the planning of a research process in terms of documentation and sharing, uh, focusing on the importance of uh, uh, documenting the process as well as the result. Uh, and also the question of uh, publicly sharing parts of the process, not only the final product. And lastly, I will discuss using the research catalog, an online uh, database and platform, uh, as a tool uh, for recording, archiving, and making public a research process, uh, not only for publishing, but for private use, uh, comparing two examples of my own artistic research projects. Uh, one is called Performing with Plants. Uh, from 2017 to 2019, and the other one, which is ongoing, is called Meetings with the Trees, or Meetings with Remarkable and Unremarkable Trees. And they use, I use the research catalog in both, but, but in slightly different ways. So, uh, uh, on the topic of temporality, since uh, I have the possibility to be the first speaker, I, I feel the need, I have to somehow... Well, it's a topic close to my heart, which will, you will understand when I show you my practice, but anyway, this is on a general level. So in a collection called Performance and Temporalization, Time Happens, from 2015, the editors, Stuart Grant, uh, Jody McNeely, and Maeva Ferrappen, sorry for the pronunciation, examine the temporality from many perspectives. And one of their main points is that time is not a given, but the result of processes like the perception, measure, experience, and worldly. So time is the product of the processes of temporalization. Time temporalizes, is temporalized. This was a quote from the, the first book mentioned here. Moreover, uh, performance allows for unique, embodied, in place experiential approaches and perspectives uh, and to question the coming forth of time. The editors present various philosophical debates regarding time, like the questions of, uh, I quote, tense, passingness, reality, relativity, and reversibility end of quote, which are topics in the analytic philosophical tradition, or the concerns of objective and subjective time in the continental tradition. 
So while I quote Heidegger's early work elaborates the structure of time as the basic constitution of the human, end of quote, the post-structuralists deal with, I quote, duration, presence, historicity, historicity, narrative, genealogy, and process, end of quote, including Deleuze's appropriation of Bexonian duration and, and the Whiteheadian event. Thus, uh, uh, the editors distinguish uh, several mm -hmm. positions and traditions in the philosophical inquiry of time, uh, such as, I quote, the analytic, the phenomenological, the post-structuralist, and the messianic, end quote, and note that the question remains unresolved. Meanwhile, performance studies scholars debate notions like liveness and presence, while I quote, diverse artistic practices engage in places, things, and bodies in installations, environmental art and durational performances are concerned with time, end of quote. In performance art, uh, temporalization is a core concern. Film, video, and music are explicitly temporal forms. And I quote, dancing bodies are not in time, they are of time, end of quote. Despite the importance of temporality in many forms of art, there is nevertheless, nevertheless I quote, a lack of well-developed methods for understanding the experience of time in performance and other art practices, and the relations between time, space, place, and the world, end of quote. So these words, quite dense, heavy words, uh, can serve as a reminder that temporality is a huge topic. Uh, in the following, I will not discuss temporality in general, but uh, rather look at some practical issues related to artistic research. So this was, uh, this was just a philosophical uh, reminder of the complications. So now, down to earth. So the wide variety in temporality of artistic research processes in various art forms uh, hinted at in the introduction, regardless of whether they take place within doctoral education or as separately funded research projects, uh, is uh, mentioned in the, in the call and introduction to this seminar. So besides teaching, examining, or evaluating artistic research from several art forms, my own artistic practice over the years spans from directing traditional drama theater via writing and directing radio plays to video installations, from semi-improvised collective performance art to year-long repeated performances of, for camera, and already within those experiences, the temporality, both the actual time of the production process and the duration of the end product can vary enormously. And then I haven't worked with film or music or, or literature, or, or you can imagine, there it, it's, a, it's a huge variety. And as I say, say the self-evident, there are differences between art forms depending on the typical output. What is the typical output? If we compare, for example, a feature film, and a dance improvisation session. If we think of terms of duration, uh, only we can imagine a feature film, an improvised dance performance, or a poetry reading to take about two hours to witness. So the, the event can take two hours, but the production process leading to each of them is probably very different in temporal terms, depending on how we define the production process, of course. Because if learning and preparation uh, are counted in, uh, they do not necessarily differ that much. Even if we think that the film project will take five years to make, but uh, it, it will take more than five years to, to learn to become a dance improviser and so on. However, temporality is often, though not always, linked to production costs and to the amount of people involved in the work. While rehearsing a theater play, at least in the 1980s, could take two to three months, a radio play was usually recorded in a week or two, uh, with the most work done in the editing phase. One of the reasons I moved from theater by a radio work to making simple solo performances for video camera was exactly to avoid the heaviness of the full production process. My aim was not necessarily to enable more flexibility in terms of research, although that benefit came as a side effect. So sorry for this uh, excursion into my own background, but so you understand from what perspective I speak. So thinking of various art forms in terms of artistic research 
It is good to remember that the changes required of an artist in transforming their ordinary working process into a research process, in transforming their artistic practice into a research method or tool, can be very different in different fields. And the difficulties relate to different aspects. In many cases, it is hard to combine a commercial or professional production with research and therefore some structural rethinking, for example, in terms of sketches or variations or etudes or how you want to think of them might be a good idea. Some artists resist such changes and insist on working as they have done before. Often research requires more time, however, and the possibility to change course in the middle of the process, which is rarely possible in large productions, uh, would be helpful in research. Temporality is probably involved in most problems, but it's rarely an isolated phenomenon. So temporality is related to everything, even though we don't highlight it. In my own doctoral work uh, ages ago, uh, I made a series of performances based on the same play as variations of sorts, as the basic research. But at that time, uh, more than 20 years ago, it was important uh, also to have high quality artistic output, as it was called. So I included big productions too, even though they were not really research, they were results of the research. Planning a large artistic production and a research process to take place at the same time is perhaps not the best possible solution. The discourse has changed. Today, I could design the process to support experimentality in a completely different manner. So, so the, it's another question, but the, this uh, idea of equivalence and the amount of work, is, uh, it's a different discourse now. So in a text, just briefly about uh, somehow the topic more. So in a text called Performing Landscape for Years in performance research uh, in 2014, I described a 12 year project that I undertook after my doctoral work with three aspects related to time. And it's a, um, it's a short text, so, but the one I reference here. And there I quote from, from there uh, three different understandings of time. So first of all, the cyclical time in nature consequent of the movement of Earth is distinct from human-made cycles of time. The cyclical time of video installations based on non-stop loops stands in contrast to the linear or narrative time of most live performances and films and can be compared with cyclical, static or progressive dramaturgy terms used in classical drama analysis or with techniques of time distortion in post-dramatic theatre. Secondly, the duration of production and the duration of consumption do not coincide in performances for the camera. The performer's experience of duration differs from the viewer's experience of duration watching the video work. A single duration of production like one recording, can be transformed into various dura durations of consumption by editing, as it, this is self-evident. And the third uh, point, repetition rather than continuity can produce an experience of extended duration. This is something I've explored in, tried to explore in my own work. If moments of time are repeated continually, and uh, an illusion of real time can be produced for the viewer, which is, of course, unlike the shared experience of duration in real-time aesthetics used in classical performance art, but still a form of continuation. So repetition becomes duration in the experience of the performer over time. And it produces a form of refrain, uh, even an existential refrain. I quote Deleuze and Qatari there. Uh, end of quote. This was from 2000, uh, something I wrote in 2014, just as a side. Text. But at the end of that text, I noted by way of conclusion, one more quote, the contrast between a comforting cyclical time and the inevitable irreversibility of linear time is actualized at the end of a cycle. At the end of this 12-year process, after literally uh, performing landscape for years, I asked myself, what have I learned about time? And my main observation is embarrassingly trivial. Time takes place through constant change in cycles of various duration, 
but you do not notice the transformations without attending to the seemingly static elements, the repetitions. So in, uh, the, the repetition or the, the keeping some things constant is needed so that we can see what is changing. Okay, these aspects of temporality are of course specific for that project. So another account of the same project based on revisits to the site of the first year and blog <coughs> notes related to, the, to them is available online. It's the se second one that I'm, I'm here listing. And uh, so artistic research exists in many forms and even the same project can be looked at and recounted in many ways. So the two examples I have listed here on my own text are describing the same process or same 12 year project from with very different techniques. So um, please, if, if, I'm, if I'm somehow incomprehensible or, or, or muddy or something, wave and, and I will be, because it, it's no point I speak here and you fall asleep. So, so please. Uh, speculative practice. Um, now, the names I list here are just because I quote them. They're, they're not because they're in, especially important. I just mentioned them, so that's why I, I list them. Well, El Elkins and, well, maybe they are at least. Elkins and, and Borgnoff are very important. Anyway, surprisingly, there are very few typologies created around artistic research. Most categorizations concern the various relationships of art and research, often assuming a dichotomy between art and research, uh, like uh, the three configurations of the studio art PhDs by Elkins, or then creating a third zone between art and research, like uh, Biggs and Carlson do, or speaking of some form of boundary work, as Henk Hen Borodov does. Uh, boundary work between art and research or art and academia. Uh, or then uh, some people suggest various combinations like uh, Kanon and us. So research interpreting art, art interpreting research, art placed in a research context, research placed in an art context, art contributing to research, research contributing to art, and so on. And research here meant in the scientific sense of the word, not artistic creation. Other typologies relate to the methodology in a more general sense, uh, adding a third dimension uh, to research. For instance, there is the distinction you might have uh, be familiar with between quantitative and qualitative approaches to research used in social sciences, and, and addition to these uh, are suggested such as performative research, uh, which has been suggested by Brad Haysman in Australia, or arts-based research um, or conceptual research. So for, for example, uh, Patricia Levy speaks of art-based research in the, in the Elliot Eisman tradition um, and uh, Smith and Deems uh, add conceptual research as a third uh, type next to, to qualitative and quantitative approaches. Often artistically, I, I can't go into the details here, but, but if you're interested, I, uh, there are many uh, books I can refer to, and I've even written about those types more myself. But, but um, Often, I think artistic research appears to find contact points with the philosophical study. Of course, it's only one type of artistic research, but uh, often, and to share its speculative freedom, despite inevitably also having an empirical practical dimension. So artistic research is also empirical and practical, besides being philosophical. And uh, that's why I like to think of artistic research as a speculative practice not necessarily linked to speculative realism in philosophy, but as an active activity engaged in imagining alternatives. So not only speculative thinking, but uh, speculative practice. Um, a, a speculation through practice. Uh, many different forms of artistic research could be called speculative practices. The point is that the speculation takes place with the help of and through the practice. But I'm fully aware that we have a huge diversification of artistic research today. So not all types of artistic research would maybe want to call themselves speculative practices. 
sorry, I was late. So here, um, um, I've, I've uh, written a short text about artistic research as a speculative practice, which is online, but it's right at the end of the network text, so that is very difficult to find. And, uh, and I also mention it in another context, but no, let's get to the main, uh, the, the model I, I suggest, which is actually, I have to say, well, I don't say it now because for the translation. So product or practice, experimentation or reflection. This is simplified. So, so don't uh, be nervous when you feel that no, 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 this is not true, because this is a very much a simplification just for the sake of experiment. So in a short text published as network text in JAR, Journal of Artistic Research, and later as part of some articles dealing mainly with other topics, I presented a model which tries to understand different types of artistic research based on their focus on practice or product on the one hand, and in terms of uh, their relationship to time in terms of reflection or future oriented, oriented experimentation on the other. So this looks, uh, here it's uh, schematized, uh, but, uh, I try to explain what I mean. So research, so if you find this model, what you see now confusing, uh, just uh, forget it and try, try to follow what I'm saying. So research, which entails an attempt to articulate and theorize an ongoing practice based on acquired and thus more or less con unconscious skills, many skills that you acquire, they become unconscious, often has a different focus and uses different methods compared with research that tries to develop and conceptualize uh, a new artwork uh, or a new type of design product or performance and explain the route to that result. So trying to explain what is your practice and how it's, uh, what you are actually doing in your practice is different task than explain how you created this singular product in the end. Uh, we could uh, therefore distinguish uh, A, a product-oriented or object-led artistic research focused on the creation of an artwork or a design product uh, from B, a practice-based or practice-led research engaged with an ongoing practice, often with a practical, critical or emancipatory knowledge interest. More of that later. To make it simple, we could say that artistic research can be product oriented when the main goal is the creation of an artwork or practice led when a particular form of practice is more important than a specific artwork or performance. Uh, if I think of it uh, from my own experience, like we, we had a performance group that we made a lot of events, but, but each event was not, of course it was special, but, but it was the the work of the group that was a practice, not that one singular performance. Whereas if you create an innovation, uh, if you create a new one singular thing, it's different. Well, this distinction could be attributed to traditions within creative and performing arts respectively, thinking that performing arts are engaged with practices and and uh, creative art, so-called creative arts, like visual arts or music composition and so on, they make individual work. But this distinction is blurred today. Contemporary art often focuses on processes and interaction rather than products and finished works. So, so it's not only about finished works in contemporary visual art either. And uh, practices like specific training methods can be reified to make into object-like entities and sold and marketed and so on. So another dimension concerns the relationship to time more explicitly. And this is the other uh, axis. Maybe I, uh, I tried to describe it in, in another, uh, you see that it's the same difference, but here it's more like a field where you can place yourself somewhere in this field. But the, the other, I spoke about this practice product uh, link, but now let's look at the other axis between um, the relationship to time more explicitly. So the research process can be uh, C, I go back for, uh, for a moment, uh, C developmental or um, experimental, striving to create something new, 
or it can also be reflective, uh, trying to understand and articulate what one has already done. Earlier, I used the word developmental, as I use here, development. <clears throat> But it might be that experimental might be a clearer in its future orientation. They're of course not the same thing, but, but uh, yeah. So either approach or rather emphasis on either aspect can be found within artistic research. Although you would expect the developmental to dominate or, or I have the bias that I always think that, that uh, artistic research is linked with experimental art. So it's like creating what is not known. But of course, this is not the only possibility. And uh, for um, yeah, for like me, for me, many pro for many proponents of of uh, artistic research, exper experimental art and artistic research are closely related. What is experimental is then another question. But for the critically minded, however, the reflective approach provides a space for questioning and criticizing the ingrained conven conventions of the art world. So, so it's a, the, the critical possibility is in the reflective approach, uh, or then for the more conservatively inclined, it offers an opportunity to formulate and document tacit knowledge, the so-called silent knowledge, which you're not aware of, uh, to, to try to articulate that and to articulate methods within an existing tradition. There is surprisingly many areas within arts where there is uh, lack of, uh, articulated tradition. Tradition is transmitted from person to person. Well, so as I said, we can form a classical field for combining these four aspects, product-oriented and experimental, practice-led and experimental, product-oriented and reflective, practice-led and reflective, as I did here, but just with the words. And creating this kind of typology can seem like a useless habit borrowed from social sciences. But it could be clarifying if we remember that most cases of artistic research include all these aspects in some degree. As generic examples, we could imagine a research project aiming at developing a technological innovation, which would be product oriented and developmental or experimental, or a new method, then it would be practice led and developmental, experimental, or a research project trying to understand the responses to an artwork or performance, which would be product oriented and reflective, or another one criticizing a traditional teaching technique, which would be practice led and reflective. In real life, clear cut examples are hard to find. Uh, nearly all research projects, for instance, include a reflective or backward looking component simply because they are reported. Mm, that's a requirement. And all forms of artistic research could be called speculative practices because the speculative speculation, the imagining of alternative modes takes place with the help of and through the practice or so I mostly. I present the model here uh, mainly to emphasize that artistic research today can take many forms. So, so this is not to, to try to press things into these categories, but to exemplify that there are many different types of artistic research today. <clears throat> and there is no need to imagine something that fits all. To keep in mind the difference between focusing on the process of investigation and the possible insights gained underway, rather than the artistic output or product, as is usually the case in artistic work, I mean normal artistic practice, can nevertheless be useful when designing one's artistic research project. Of course, the art field has changed, but still there is a very much a focus on the product. So in, in, the, in the art, in the field of, of professional art, it's the product that is shared and so on. But in research, we can look at the process. Okay, briefly about institutional differences. Uh, this is more like, uh, because I thought it might be of interest for you. Uh, but this is, I am really not uh, actually probably not the right person even to speak of them, but I tried to look at the two uh, contexts where I've been working uh, with, because they organize doctoral studies in very different ways. So besides differences between different art forms and their traditions or different types of artistic research based on orientation as discussed above, there are big differences in institutional approaches and requirements and they limit the possibilities of structuring one's artistic research project, as you probably well know. 
Some institutions favor doctoral models that are more like traditional PhDs, uh, where the written dissertation is the main thing. And artworks or artistic practices remain data or material uh, to be analyzed, or supporting material on the side, or even an auxiliary appendix. So they're not really uh, sort of the main part. And this choice was sometimes made by artists in the early years, even if a more experimental approach would have been possible, simply because it was easier to use existing models. And there was quite a lot of mistrust in artists doing research at all. Uh, and because integrating scholarly research and artistic practice can be very difficult. <laughs> Uh, and now this is a short note, which is uh, not in the paper, but I just added for clarification, sorry. Uh, it's uh, very difficult to write about your own work in a way that it doesn't feel like marketing or, you know, advertising or, or professional. Uh, this is my experience. So, so how do you speak critically about mm. your own work without then diminishing it? Mm. To the, we can discuss this later. So, so that's one of the difficulties in speaking about your own work. There are other difficulties too. But back to the institutions, which I have listed the links here. But Cote um, uh, is actually, I'd have to say, Cote is Kumliya Technis Kaviokspones. It's the uh, technological university. I just took, they had a good explanation. So I did it from there. Uh, so, um, there are institutions that favor doctoral models where the artistic component is emphasized, as was the early model in Sibelius Academy in Finland. Sibelius Academy is the music academy, where an artistic doctorate was seen as an equivalent to a PhD, a show of mastery or artistic excellence, and had nothing to do with research at all. It was almost actually the opposite. Today, what is often called the Nordic model of artistic research with Norway as a prominent example, is stressing the importance of high quality artworks and emphasizes knowledge production on artistic grounds, but nevertheless insists on research, on artistic contributions to knowledge, and also that the research should benefit the artistic field in question, as well as uh, a strong ties to professional fields. So, so artistic research is not something done for the academia. Artistic research is something it's a knowledge production for the art field in question. The emphasis between artwork and written component, or between theoretical and practical aspects, can shift depending on uh, developments in the field in question, even within one university. An important, uh, one important uh, factor is whether the institution or art school has university status or not or whether they have to collaborate with an existing university, as some art schools did in the beginning. One reason Finland was so early in developing artistic research was the university status granted to the major art schools already in the 1970s. That meant that the institutions could decide themselves how they wanted to structure their doctoral studies. This right uh, was officially granted to Stockholm University of the Arts when it was established in 2014 only as a collaboration between several old art schools. Of course, in Sweden, other universities have had doctorate education for a very long time, like Gothenburg and now and so on. But, but nevertheless, so it's a, it's a huge difference. And uh, of course, doctoral processes in artistic research mostly follow the general principles of doctoral work in each country. And this explains most of the differences between the two, two universities of the arts that I have worked in, in Helsinki and in Stockholm. It's the Swedish model, which is, I think is quite interesting, and I find it rather strange myself, has a four-year salary position. So the doctoral candidates are hired for four years with a salary, and uh, it's a time limit of four years, and the process is divided into uh, three public seminars before the final defense, which is the 30% seminar, the 50% seminar, and the 80% seminar. Instead of saying there is a seminar at the end of the first year, the second year, and the third year, it's, it's uh, conceived of in percentages of the final work. So it's like, if you think of it, if you would think of it as a written dissertation, it's how big part of the work is done. And uh, I think it's quite... Uh, 
it sounds very limited and strict, um, but uh, it's quite interesting model. But there, uh, uh, yeah, uh, there. Uh, this is called the doctoral ladder, and it's uh, described in uh, one study handbook from the what they call the Royal Institute of Technology, and I quote from there. Please excuse me if this is convoluted language. But this is exactly what. the salary for students is regulated by the doctoral ladder, Dr. Amstege. There are four defined levels in the doctoral ladder, and these are negotiated annually between the union and the university. Step one in the agreement is the starting salary. Advancement to higher levels is normally approved when the 30, 50, and 80% of the planned study has been completed. According to the milestone specified uh, in the electronic individual study plan, advancement assumes that the doctoral student has performed according to the time plan presented in the plan. It is important to remember that circumstances differ by project and individual, and thus planning and performance goals must be individually adapted. Okay, end of course. So the 30% startup seminar with the outside discussant or conversation partner or opponent, or how do you want to call it, it's an equivalent of 20 credits and it's about 10 to 15 months full-time work. The 50% midterm seminar with the discussant focusing on progress to date and work remaining, it's about 40 credits. And it's uh, at the time of about 22 to 26 months full time work, and the 80% final seminar with an external discussion as well, and with a focus on remaining steps to complete the completion. What more does have, has to be done before the final defense, which is 50 to 60 credits? It's about 36 to 40 months full time work. Well, at UniR Stockholm, uh, or ESCOHO, as it is called, the requirements in artistic research likewise include a 60 credit study component besides the artistic project. But instead of a thesis, the main work is the documented artistic research project, which is worth 100 credits. And uh, in the study guide, the pros and seminars, the, the doctoral ladder is not specified, but the ladder is usually followed in practice. So people organize there their seminars accordingly. And I remember uh, one uh, colleague who or made your fun of it this and organized a 68.5% seminar. But, but still, the, the, the steps are useful. At UniArts Helsinki, the doctoral positions uh, are very different. They're not, no, there's no salaries. They're, it's not a paid position. And students apply for grants from outside sources. And there is no equivalent to the latter time-wise either. The structure of the doctoral studies differ between the academies. So in performing arts, in fine arts, and in music, they're different. In performing arts, the scope of the doctoral program is 240 credits, and the doctoral research itself is worth 180 credits. And the supporting studies uh, that are mainly carried out during the first two years of studying are worth 60 credits. The doctoral dissertation includes one to three artistic components, uh, which will be pre-examined and a written commentary. This is the performing arts. In fine art, the requirements are rather similar. Typical a doctoral thesis uh, project consists of one or several visual art components, a maximum of total 140 credits, as well as a written component. In addition, the thesis project must be available as an electronically archivable documentation. And they use, in the Finance Academy, they extensively use the research catalog for that. In both performing arts, and, and also with the work that is not done uh, at the research catalog, like as expositions, they put a PDF of the uh, uh, file of the written thing in the research catalog. So they're, they're archived, but yeah, that's a side issue. Um, in both performing arts and fine arts, the artistic components are examined or pre-examined by two assigned examiners. In fine arts, by also by a pre-examination board, as they are made public. So not at the end, but during the process. And uh, together with the so-called linking paper, which relates the artistic component to the overall research plan. So if you have a public exhibition of a work, 
uh, which is shown to the public as a normal exhibition, then you write a linking paper to the examiners explaining in what way this is uh, research, part of your research and how it links to your plan and so on, which the audience need not take part of. Um, in music, uh, doctoral education is divided into three programs with a different emphasis, and that reflects the old dichotomies. So there's an art study program, there is a research study program, and an applied study program. And this reflects the historical dichotomy between doctorates in musicology or history and doctorates of artistic excellence. My experience, however, relates mainly to the performing arts and the fine arts academies, so I'm not the person to explain the situation uh, in the music department now, but I, I know that there has, there has been interest in artistic research as well, so it's not the, the old dichotomy is, is not so strong any longer. Another, this is about, this was about doctoral education, but another institutional aspect is the funding of artistic research projects beyond doctoral education, either postdoc or then for artists outside in the field. And such funding has been developed in Norway through the Norwegian Artistic Research Program, program NAR, which uh, today functions with another name, DIKU, and which also was uh, a little bit like Reskamp probably, what was a doctoral program originally, but it, now the, the, the doctoral work is uh, spread to universities, but they still make joint uh, seminars. And they have this program, project program, where they fund uh, artistic research projects uh, that are not linked to doctoral education. In Sweden, there is a committee for artistic research within the Swedish Research Council, uh, which I've been participating in a few years, uh, which uh, gives grants to, uh, to there are project calls for project applications. Uh, and the project have temporal limits for three or, or three or four years and need to be connected to a university or similar institution. So somebody who takes the, they're not private grants, but they're, they're research grants uh, hosted by the university, even if the, if the research itself is individual or a separate group. And unlike other research funding, the applicants uh, do not need to have a doctoral degree. And these grants have often included experimental art projects rather than formal research. In Finland, however, although we are very far with the doctoral education, we have nothing of the sort for artistic research projects. We're really back behind there. Uh, mainly private foundations support artistic research fund, uh, projects like Kone Foundation, uh, while artistic research can be part of larger research projects funded by Academy of Finland. So, so the how to do things with performance that was mentioned in the beginning, it was uh, Academy of Finland funded research project, but it was only part of it was artistic research. So such institutional differences that I have now um, briefly into that have a strong long-term impact on the development of artistic research. If you think of probably exactly with, for instance, in developments in France or in Canada and so on, there are, we could discuss many examples. I, I just mentioned these two. What am I doing with time? Oh, I'm doing very badly with time. <laughs> so, uh, focusing on process. This is a part which I really, uh, it's from book, I just jumped it, I, I want, very much would like you to read it, but I'm not going to. I'm, I'm jumping to the an example of, of uh, an assignment from the Norwegian program. So, uh, in, in the text that I jump, I just uh, explain various uh, opinions of process and the focus on process in artistic research. Uh, but uh, um, one of the seminars for doctoral candidates in the Norwegian program is devoted to the questions of unfolding and articulation. And I have led it a few times because I was part of the board a few years ago. And in that seminar, we are planning the documentation and sharing of the research projects. So it's just one seminar among many other seminars, keeping in mind the difference between documenting the process and documenting the result on the one hand, and sharing the process and sharing the result on the other. So documentation need not be shared with the public. It can be made only for one's own use. 
for example, to serve as notes for writing the final reflections. And sharing need not be uh, sharing documentation only, <clears throat> but can take many forms and, and can also be limited to specific groups and so on. So for most artists, uh, sharing the result, the product is normal, whether, whether as a performance or exhibition or concert or film, etc. while sharing the process might feel strange. This is different in different fields. For instance, in dance, there has been a long tradition of, of working progress, sharing and so on, but it, it depends on the field. And also it is easier for some artists, while other find it difficult, partly depending on their way of working. Some artists might be reluctant to share the hidden part of the process and keep it private. And in the seminar, we focus on the point that we can decide uh, which aspects of the process we share and which part we keep for ourselves. So it's up to us to plan sharing and documentation. So sharing the process, explain, explaining and discussing how, how the work has evolved, how the knowledge was generated is in any case central in artistic research often. So, so one of the things that distinguishes, in my view, artistic research from the ordinary artistic practice is exactly this focus on, on sharing the process. Well, anyway, you can see here the assignment. And if you're interested now, this is on paper, so there is no planning to, to write it down. But the, the, the assignment is to it's exactly to distinguish, to, to create a plan in two parts, where one plan is for sharing the artistic research process, and the other plan is for documenting the artistic research process. What, what the, because, uh, uh, yeah, uh, what are the techniques you want to use, how regularly, and, 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 and so on. It's, it's, uh, it's not self-evident. Uh, well, so in discussing, I'm not repeating now the assignment, completely in the interest of time, but in discussing the various approaches that doctoral candidates use when considering the assignment, when they create these draft plans in relation to their artistic practice and the artistic research project they are embarking on, we have noted, among other things, the importance of designing the research process in the first place and of thinking of possible nodes or turning points in advance, as well as planning what is made public and shared with whom and when. So you could say that research is uh, diving into the unknown. How can I plan it? But, but of course, you can plan uh, some uh, instances and then allow for moments where, where you dive into the unknown. Uh, we have also compared the difficulties related to sharing the questions and the process rather than the artistic product within different fields. What are the customary ways of discussing work and how can they be adapted or changed to suit one's project? When planning the process, one crucial aspect is how to adjust to requirements that are unfamiliar or how to include elements that are not part of one's ordinary artistic process. In short, how to learn new things. And now, uh, please interrupt me if it's needed, but I, I think it's very important to show a little bit of the research catalog. <clears throat> Although I'm happy to, uh, because I'm working, not working, but I'm part of, of uh, editorial board for JAR, and we're very much interested in having also more contributions from the, from the French world. Uh, I'm happy if somebody's interested, come and drag me and I, I talk more about the research catalog during the days. <clears throat> but uh, here I have a, uh, yeah, okay. So finally, I will say a few words about the research catalog and use two of my own projects as examples when discussing as one available tool for documenting and or sharing one's research projects, process, not only for publishing the results. And the research catalog, if you're not familiar with it, is an international searchable online database and publishing platform for artistic research, which is free to use for individual artists and researchers. You have to register, but at the same time as it is the uh, publishing platform for several online journals, um, first among them the Journal for Artistic Research, JAR, but also there are others like the Ruku, which is published in Finland, or Vis, which is a joint publication by, by Stockholm and, and Norway. And in the, the research catalog can be used in at least three ways. 
as a publication platform and searchable database with possibility to comment, as a personal tool for organizing, presenting, and archiving work, because it's a, um, you choose what you make public and what you make private. So you can use it as an archive where uh, others cannot see anything, where, where only you can see it. And, and thirdly, um, uh, as a tool for collaborating with uh, specific groups only. It's not a, a mainly collaboration tool. I think it's better for publishing and archiving, but you can, for instance, author an exposition together with a few people, and, and, and then when you're ready with it, then may you share it and so on. Uh, the, uh, as an educational tool, the, the research catalog is useful because it enables an active documentation of practice for one's own use which can be arranged and conceived as an exposition and becomes a tool for reflection like mind map. I use it personally extensively just to because the older I get, the less space I have in my brain, I forget everything. So I put something somewhere where I know I always can find the year, the date, the material, everything. But you can use other platforms for that. The research catalog enables a simultaneous presentation of material juxtaposed instead of or as complement to the linear storyline approach to reporting research. So you can it can be created like a mind map. And Michael Schwab, uh, who is the chief editor of JAR and one of the people who conceived of the research catalog in the first place, uh, here's a quote that he, he notes that while the notion of exposition may suggest a simple unveiling of research, in the context of JAR, the term also indicates a creative act. An exposition uh, is a form of making that turns an, art, turns an, art, an artistic idea into an epistemic claim. So an artistic idea is translated into a knowledge claim uh, by exposing it in, in this context. Of course, exposition in other contexts means something else. Consequently, speculations regarding the ontology of artistic research, what artistic research is, are less relevant. More important are the epistemologies that are proposed, so the possibilities of knowledge that are proposed, that suggest how a particular practice may be understood as research. So, so how can, what is the research dimension in this artistic practice? How can I expose the research in? Uh, the notion of exposition is an example of complications related to interdisciplinarity. For, for a photographer, exposition associates to exposure. For a musical composer or writer, to the introduction of a piece. For somebody familiar with Latin languages, it could mean simply expo, an exhibition, probably for you. Ex exposing something as research could also be criticized for indicating that something is not research, but only presenting as if it was research. But that is another discussion. And so I'll, instead of, was there something important here? Yes, no. The two examples are, are the performing with plants project uh, and uh, the, yes, the, the meetings uh, with remarkable and unremarkable trees project. Um, and now I'm going to, to the research catalog. So let's see if I can. So. Sorry, I'm in the wrong place. I thought I had it ready here, but no. So this is one example, an, an exposition of a, one project on the timeline. And it's, a, it's based on the idea of a timeline. So, so here is the navigation you can see up there. Here is the model, it's huge. So when I began, I put here the, the application, formal application, and then uh, I started to make a timeline and some previous, it's a bilingual, some previous uh, publications, some experiments in, in Stockholm, uh, like uh, these are still images and they link to my blog page and so on. But the main, uh, the main structural log logic was that, that I 
add things as they as I start something. So so there would be now if this would be during this project, I would add at the moment in time presented at Prescan in Grenoble. And of course, this is not uh, it's a, it's an archive, but it's uh, it's not very yeah. It looks a little bit messy, although it's very tightly timeline. In the 2018, for instance, I started. Uh, uh, so all the all the all the projects are linked as uh, separate. Now it takes time for the images to load. But this is, for instance, a time lapse video I work with, which I then documented every time I like. The same day or the day after, I put still images here and wrote something on the blog, and so it's uh, like accumulation. But it's uh, uh, this is like one page linked to from the timeline, and it took for the whole year. Important to put it back to. Uh, uh, let's see if this works. So it, and at the end of this long, long, long timeline, where this is all publicly available, and it was publicly available from the beginning, it would not have to have been. I could have made it private and published it only at the very end, but I prefer to share the process publicly. And I'm, I'm not saying it's ideal, it's typical for me. But, uh, but at the very end, then, here is the book. That, um, at the very end, publications and other public output are listed on a separate page here. So here I made a selection of the main output for the report and for the, this was funded by the Swedish Research Council. So the, and, and some things came later, so I added it here and so on. Uh, so the other example, just briefly. Which I'm now working because because this timeline structure uh, was I wasn't so happy with it. It's visually not so. Uh, you could make it more beautiful, but but uh, but I wanted to try something that was not uh, structured based on time, but actually uh, structured based on individual trees. So so this structure is uh, more <laughs> boxes, more portfolio like. But here I also use the timeline in the sense of. It, I began with these boxes, but then to, when the trees were quite a few, I decided that I add them to the right always. So, and, and it's not like uh, some pages, these go all to, to uh, this is like one tree in the same way in Ere for one month, just every day practice. But, uh, but most of these pages are not, they're actually some residency place, some city, uh, some event, uh, which is the last one, let's see. Uh, oh no, but this is, uh, this is a day with a pine. Uh, so there is actually two, two days with uh, different pines, but they, they're like from every hour from morning to night. This is Sedakti now. I don't want to go into it, explain the project. I try to keep it on the level of the research catalog. But this was like the year 2020. And so I, to make it clearer, so to, to make it not so along the line, uh, the second year, I started to put the trees uh, on a second line. So, so this is a structured uh, partly in time but, and partly in place because uh, for instance, here is on the tree line. I was in Kilbisjärvi Ars Bioarctica residency, and here I put uh, all the, the the trees I I recorded with on the tree line. This is of course not time lapse videos, but but other type of experiments. And, so on. and in this uh, version, I also add uh, presentations or lectures and uh, publications. So far, only one, and, and uh, works in exhibitions on separate. So it becomes more of an archive. Um, the good thing, yeah. if I'm coming to a close, the good thing with the, why I like this, besides for my own use, is that when I write about the work, uh, I can make a link. If I, if I, if I use examples from here, uh, this is not meant to be a publication. This is an archive. But if I write about, um, well, let's say if I write, write about, uh, 
my experiments on the tree, tree line. I haven't written yet. Then I can make a link to these pages, which serve. I can make a new exposition if it's an online uh, and, and put to the work, rearrange it there. But I also can make a link to this as an archive in the same way as, um, yeah. Um, maybe I should, yeah, did I, did I have some fine, fine ending points? Maybe I should just, uh, because I'm, I, I know there is a big program with a lot of things. So, so maybe I go to show you my profile page because that's something that, they have changed the research catalog. So I have a lot of works there that the notion of work is no longer there. But, but here is like what I have published in different ways. Uh, and this is all public, but if I would now log in on my own, you would see also a, a lot of these squares that are gray. And that means they are not public, they are only for me. All right, so um, just to finish with something. Uh, so the importance of the archive on the research catalog uh, um, in terms of documentation for me is on the, on the one hand, gathering all the material and basic facts in one place for easy finding, uh, thus documenting the work for myself. And on the other hand, creating a source that I can refer to, for example, by creating a link to a specific page when discussing a particular work or publishing an article on a related topic, or why not giving a presentation? So now if I would, I'm actually going to present a practice in online presentation next Tuesday to St. Petersburg. And I will show some material from the RC in, in part of that talk. Um, so I have chosen the strategy to show my material immediately, to make it, to share the process as an ongoing thing and to register the working process often daily through still images and to share them openly. But even though I have chosen to keep the archive public, it could as well be kept private and only some parts of it open for public access later or now. Or, so this can be planned as you wish. Uh, in my work, documentation and public sharing does coincide. I share the process of creating material even when I don't know whether it will become a work at all. But that does not need to be the case for everybody. And in some sense, I still consider the videos works. Some of the works are bad. They're not very good works. They will not have a life. They are just uh, material. And some of them will be good and be shown in ex exhibitions. So, so that, yeah. But the, the credo to finish with would be uh, experimenting with how to structure and depict the process. How to document it and share it uh, can be very helpful in planning the project. So don't leave that to to do that you first gather the material and then you create a portfolio in the end, but start the project by, or do it halfway to, to how can I share this? How do I structure it? This is my advice or my, uh, something I would like to give to this context of discussion. So uh, thank you for your attention and thank you for translating and, and me jumping out of everything I'm doing.